you, Mary. Um, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, I'm going to dip into the science. I'm sure you heard some wonderful science about adult brain development yesterday from Christian, who's a world expert, actually, on the empathetic brain. And some of the new work that I'll talk about today about touch, which came after my work on imitation, and I'll try to tie those together, is connected very, very deeply with his uh, pioneering studies in adults uh, about the importance of touch and empathy. So I'll try to make that connection. Uh, where There are very similar messages here to perhaps what he spoke about yesterday. I wasn't here yesterday, but I want to run the story through child development and the brain development in the child and the social-emotional development of the child, the relation that the child develops with an adult. So those are the connections I would like to make. So just uh, briefly, what I'm going to talk to de about today is a little a bit about brain development in children to orient you towards that. I'll talk about social learning in children, and touch is the new work that I want to get to and talk about it. This is the neurobiological roots of empathy in young children. Then I want to turn a little bit to the dark side about children being so social and their brains being attuned to others, and that is that little babies are not born prejudiced, but we've done some research about what's the earliest age at which they begin to develop prejudice, and I want to show you some films and talk about that today. Uh, it's during the preschool period. And we think we know a little bit about the mechanisms of how children develop and catch prejudice from others, which I think is very, very important in today's society. And of course, Roots of Empathy as a program has always been interested in developing civilized, empathetic, um, communicative young children. And in some ways, it, as you know, combats bullying and this idea of divisions between us and them by using empathy as a tool. So the research actually on the development of prejudice is relevant to this entire program and what good it can do in the world. And then on the more positive side, uh, there's postdoc at my laboratory from Israel who's doing some wonderful research on music and synchrony in young children, actually experimental studies about how to increase cooperation in children through music Another theme that, of course, Mary is very fond of and is um, all through Roots and Seeds of Empathy about the role of music. So again, this is a lab study about that. And then finally, I want to talk about raising awareness in my field about child development and the importance of young children. I know this is a friendly audience uh, to that message, but we as researchers in university labs do have a role in trying to get the science out in an authentic way. And I want to show you some strategies and steps that we use um, for that in our country. So to begin with, uh, just a very short bit orienting towards neurobiology and brain development. And one of the things that um, people do when they measure brain development in children is to look at structural development of the brain. That is the different parts of the brain and fiber tracks and what, um, what areas of the brain serve which functions. And that is often studied when you look at brain anatomy through MRI machines that you're all very, very used to. Children oftentimes, when you study young children, infants, are actually asleep in the MRI machine because if you move, it distorts the signal, as you know. So looking at awake alert babies interacting with their partner cannot be done in an MRI or fMRI machine in a little baby. So we needed to be, move beyond the wonderful tools of MRI and fMRI that's used with adults to do something else in babies. It's a way of measuring the structure of the brain. But we're using a device called an MEG, and this is a six-month-old baby in an MEG, and you can see the six-month-old can be awake and alert, sitting in the MEG machine and moving, and because of particular signal processing routines, it's possible to correct for head movement, and that allows us to measure really important things about social development in young babies that hasn't been possible 
obviously when a baby is asleep in an MRI. So that's called brain function as opposed to measuring the anatomy or brain structure. And the last thing you see on this slide is, of course, we, as all of you in, in the room, once, you, once the science is in and you've done some science, it's important to try to use this to help families. We're doing it by getting the message out. I know the Roots of Empathy program and the Seeds of Empathy program is doing it by helping children and families and governments to see the importance of empathy. And so I want to sh share with you what we're doing to get that uh, message out. So that's the idea. And now a little bit here about uh, brain development. This is a chart about brain development in human beings from birth to adulthood. And really the message here, this is a measure about brain, uh, measuring brain weight, but there are many measures of brain development. The main message is the most rapid time of brain development is certainly in the first three to five years of life. Obviously, K through 12 education is incredibly important. No one would want to take funding away from that and think it's not important, but governments and policymakers needed to be convinced uh, a while back uh, that in zero to five is rampant learning and that children probably learn more in zero to five than they ever learn in any other five-year period of their life, more than they learn from 10 to 15, 20 to 25, or alas, from 50 to 55. <laughs> And so we are trying, we and others are trying to get the message out that this is an incredibly important period. And one of the important things that helps brain development during this period is, of course, social interaction with others, which is something I want to get to. This is a famous slide that shows things uh, uh, about synaptic connections in the children from birth to about 14 years of age. And it's thought now that children are born with just about all the neurons, the particular cells at birth that they're going to have. There's some growth of neurons, but not uh, that much. The important thing that's happening in development is the synaptic connections, the connections between the neurons. And there, of course, there's prolific uh, synaptic development that occurs in the first year of life, first years of life, and in fact, by year three, children are overconnected. They have more synaptic connections than we do as adults, and there's a phenomenon known as neural pruning. That's not a bad thing. Neural pruning is a good thing. What happens is the child's uh, neural connections get tuned, pruned, and shaped in part, some of that happens maturationally, but in part because of the social and physical environment that they live in, the stimulation that they have and then they become, uh, it's, it's pruned down by about 14 years of age and there's uh, more crystallization about what that child, the, the standing connections that are in that child's brain. Of course, all through life, as you learn, as you develop, as you heard Christian's lecture yesterday, you develop new, new neural synapses. You didn't develop no, new neurons based on his talk, but you probably made new neural connections. So connecting in the social world between people is what it's about, and in the brain, it's connectivity in the brain uh, and making synaptic connections that helps um, you, is a product of learning and helps with new learning. So one of the things scientists are studying are the fiber tracks. Those are the sort of telephone wires that connect one part of the brain to another part of the brain, and we can now study that in young children. And that's very, very exciting because we can look at the connectivity in the children's brain. Uh, Mary is fond of saying that love grows brains. She said that before it was true. No, she said it before scientists knew that it was true. But it is true uh, that love or social connections or social interactions, the eye-to-eye -eye contact you have with the child, the body motions that you show the child, the speech they hear, the languages they hear, the lip movements they watch you do when you talk, and your emotional expressions. For sure, those types of social interactions is changing the brain connectivity in your little baby. And so we're, as scientists, quite interested in that. So I want to dip in now about social learning 
and what kids do learn from watching other people. You know, human beings are a very special species. We make art, we do music, we study science, we have formal education. Other animals and species for certain learn, and other animals have social interaction for sure, but human beings are very special species. Christian, Mary, other people are quite interested in whether empathy is a special and compassion or a special feature of the human brain or what something human beings can do that other animals can't do as well. That's an interesting and uh, de issue that is debated in science about chimpanzees and other animals. But for sure, there's something special about human beings. And scientists, neurobiologists, evolutionary psychologists have wondered for a long time what makes human brains so special. There's a lot of continuity, but there's some differences in what human beings can do and other animals can't. What makes us some so special? And evolutionary biologists have come upon a very unlikely idea, and the unlikely idea, but one that's uh, gained a lot of traction, is that we're born without our brains fully developed. We're born neurally immature. A lot of the wiring in the baby's brain happens postnatally, not uh, to begin with. The baby's brain is wired. These connections are made through, cult through the cultural interaction, through interacting with others. So it's literally true that social learning, social interaction is shaping the brain. And so we have a little baby born with a social brain attuned to others who l that learns extremely, extremely rapidly from social others. They learn uh, also by themselves, but they learn an enormous amount through social interaction. So there are several uh, theories about child development and ways that we know children develop, and I want to emphasize the social learning. Let me just go through just a, a few theories here. You know, there's reinforcement learning that Skinner was famous for, and that idea was that human children learn chiefly by patterns of reward and punishment. And while it's true, that babies do learn for, by, through reward and punishment, they learn so much more through other mechanisms. If you think about it, the little child, um, you know, take a, a two-year-old, is copying what you do, picking up a cell phone and wanting to talk in it, typing on your computer keys. It's not that they learn those things through reward and punishment, because often they're learning things even though the parent is saying, don't uh, touch my keyboard and my precious word processing. Honey, don't do that. And the child wants to do it anyway. And so, although many animals, I, I've learned not to criticize dogs in talks like this, but it's early in the morning and I'm gonna slip up and make that mistake. Um, if you wanna train a dog, you do, which is a very intelligent and loving animal, let me get that message in. <laughs> but not a baby, and, and it's really important to understand some of the things that makes the difference. And here's some of the things that make a difference. If you want to teach a dog to sit, you, you have treats in your pocket, and, and you say the word sit is a cue. The dog doesn't know what it means, but if it moves a little bit, you reward the dog, you say sit again and reward the dog, and you do what's called shaping up the dog to sit to that cue. Now that's reward and punishment. And Skinner discovered you can use reward and punishment to train rats, you can use them to train dogs, and you really have to do it. But that's not how you walk around training your little baby. You don't have food in your pocket or a bottle of milk and put it in the baby's mouth and give the baby a squirt of milk every time they do something you want to. That's not what's happening. Babies learn through a different mechanism. So what's a different mechanism? A second theory had to do with maturation of the brain and maturation of motor behavior. And this was on the idea that most of the uh, patterns of behavior that a child's going to come on to come uh, to do was built into the brain and unfolded on a maturational time schedule. And again, on many animals, that's true. If you have mountain goats, mountain goats are born, and very soon after they're born, minutes after they're born, get up and can climb up a mountain. It's amazing. They're born with certain motor routines that are there to begin with. But our red, wrinkly little newborn baby at birth is not born that way. They don't have the same adult skills that we have. So all that they learn is not through um, 
motor maturation and built into the brain at, on an unfolding clock. We know that because part of what we learn are cultural tools and cultural inventions. Here's a piece of plastic I'm just arbitrarily picking up and I'm shining the light. This is not in my biological endowment to recognize this. I might recognize a smiling face, might recognize emotion, I might recognize a fear stimulus, but when I do this to you, Nothing lights up in the brain that hasn't been educated about this. If I smile at you, something might light up. If I make a fear face, something might light up. But if I show you a cell phone or a $20 bill or this thing, nothing to begin with lights up in the baby's brain, but it eventually does. And we want to know the mechanisms of that rampant learning. So it's not reinforcement and punishments. That's the chief way that describes us as humans. It's not maturation of, of fixed motor patterns on a schedule. Piaget had a third theory, the third theory that there was stage development theory, and that he talked about, and Piaget was a great, great pioneer, genius in my field in developmental psychology, absolutely but doesn't mean that everything the genius said was right. A lot of it was right, but here's a, a thing that we want to change in what he said. His chief idea was that the child was an independent explorer, and he uh, watched and took notes of his three children on the floor as they learned to do things. You've all heard about object permanence. He took a rattle and hid it under his beret, actually, and he discovered that young children are very, very interested in the object when it's in sight, and when it's covered and out of sight, they seem to lose interest. And it was a brilliant discovery, been replicated many times. And Piaget thought that the way the child learned about object permanence was through motor play by him or herself on the floor. The same thing about learning about space and other dimensions of development than he wrote about. He was very, very good at emphasizing the child as an independent learner, independent learner. So that was option three. But you are interested in empathy. You are interested in social interaction. So how does that fit into reinforcement learning? It's not that we just praise and reinforce our child to pay attention to our emotions. They have some natural draw to that. How do we go beyond maturation? How do we even go beyond genius Piaget's theory about stage development and independent discovery by the lone child in the Geneva living room that Piaget take note, took notes on. And I ha want to uh, put forward the argument that social learning, this fourth idea, that children learn a lot, an amazing amount about people and things in the world and things uh, by watching how others use things. And so back to my set or how they interact with one another. They watch social interactions and learn about people by watching others, and they learn about objects and causality by watching the goal-directed actions of people. So it's not all lone discovery, but social observation and learning, which has its own mechanisms. So back to the cell phone, if you take this hunk of plastic and you put it on the, uh, you know, on the dirt, on the ground in a tribe that has never seen cell phones before, if you could find one in the world, but you can imagine the thought experiment. If you put that hunk of, of plastic on the dirt floor, little children who had never seen an adult use a cell phone would not know what to do with it. But if you, in Seattle, in my lab, and you do experiments as we do, of take a cell phone and put it on the floor with a bunch of other objects. You see little children run over to the cell phone, pick it up, and even hold it to the ear. They don't take the cell phone and put it on their belly. They hold their cell phone to the ear. That's not because the mother has reinforced them to do it. It's not because the maturation of motor systems that has when you see that cell phone goes <clears throat> Right? Maybe if I make a fear face at you, there's that reaction, but not to cell phones. Yet, little babies, we have a film of a two and a half year old baby picking up a cell phone on our floor and acting in the way she thought was an adult. She, I don't think she knew what she was saying. She picked up the cell phone and said, hi, can I hear you? Can I hear you? You're aching up. You're aching up. And so I don't think she knew what she was saying about your breaking up. She thinks you just hold these things to your and say, you're aching up, you're aching up. And she walked around 
acting like she sees others act. That is social learning. It's not only social learning about inter interpersonal relations, which we're interested in, but learning about objects. So our kids use us as role models, and we're role models not just for our teenagers, not just for our third grade kids, but I would like to argue that we're role models even in preschool to the two and three year olds and even to our infants. This is a child in Africa who's an 11 year old child who in his culture, instead of holding cell phones to the ears, adults hold machetes. And it turns out cultures differ in this culture, letting your child have a machete when he or she is young is something you can do. They learn to use it. The important thing here is not about safety <laughs> and what our culture thinks of this practice, the kids are perfectly safe. The important thing is that when this child sees that tool, the child runs over to picks up the tool and uses it, we put, the child knows to put cell phones to his or her ear this child knows to put the machete to the fruit. That's what the child knows. Probably not by reward and punishment, not by maturation, not by independent discovery did this just waft into the child's brain, but by social learning. So social learning is an incredible, powerful tool. Uh, it's related to imitation. That's what I have spent part of my life uh, dedicated to looking at. And we've looked at very young children and the rampant social learning that happens in the first few years of life. So I have a very short film here. It's 30 second film and I just wanted to share it with you. It shows young babies in my laboratory. Alan Alda is a movie star who from Hollywood that you probably saw on MASH. He came up to do a sort of Nova type show in our lab and I just want to show you this child in the laboratory. Here she's looking up at us, and Alan Alda puts beads in the cup. The little baby's too young to speak. We don't use language. She just watches us. Emotion. <laughs> she's happy at what she did, but on first try, she did it by observation. I take a camping cup. I do something odd, turn it over, squash it looks at the object, looks at the person, looks at the object. And then she does the right, imitation. We're gonna talk about the powerful mechanism of imitation. Alan Alda pulls apart a toy we built in our lab. She looks at the person, the object, the person, interpersonal relations. Good pop, he says. And then I asked the movie star to do a completely novel event that this child hadn't seen before. And he touches his head to this object. She looks wide-eyed at this. Do you want to turn? <laughs> and she does the action. So this is two things. One, option four, social learning, is hugely important to human beings, option four. That's one of the things that's important. And we've studied behavioral development for many years. A second thing that's interesting that Christiane perhaps talked about yesterday that I've been fascinated about is what is the neural basis that would allow the little human brain to be the most prolific young uh, learner on the planet. Human beings learn by imitation first prior to language and they learn more prolifically that by imitation than any other species. Other species may be able to imitate particular actions, but human babies are imitative generalists. They can imitate action, they can imitate sounds, they can imitate actions on objects, they can imitate pure bodily actions without action in a goal-directed way on objects. We are imitative generalists and we have a brain that prepares us to do it that I want to talk about um, very soon. Before I get to that, this is the picture that Mary mentioned, 1977 uh, research that we did that we happened with two and three week old babies and then subsequently went into the laboratory, in, uh, sorry, in the newborn nursery and we were able to show that newborn babies imitate. And the youngest baby I tested in this uh, newborn imitation work was 42 minutes old at the time of birth. The mother had several children before, and I was telling her about the importance of 
finding out whether this is something that human beings could do, whether they were born learning. And she said, well, Dr. Meltzoff, why don't you just come in and you can witness the whole birth and I, you can be your first one to stick out your tongue at my young baby. And so we have a film of the baby when the baby was 42 minutes old, had never seen anybody on the planet pick, poke out its tongue, his tongue at her before. She hadn't seen the tongue come out. She looked into my eyes and then began to tongue protrude in response. This was a really important emotional moment to me when you're sitting face to face with a young baby and you know this is the first, you know the reinforcement, the external reinforcement history of this child, and you know this baby hasn't been trained to do it, the fact that there's that interpersonal connection that they can map from another person to themselves is profoundly moving, and it's moving in a way that mothers, in fact, experience in the next weeks and months of life. So I wrote a paper called Like Me. It was a like me developmental, social developmental theory that ties together some of these things that I said about three chief theories about, him, about human development and arguing that social learning and imitation was fundamentally important and had been missed more than it should have been missed in developmental theory. And I argued that children right from beginning are processing movements that they see in the world as being like me, that they can observe certain patterns and recognize that they can be mapped onto their own body movements. And that connectivity at the level of the body and coding actions they see out there in terms of their own action is fundamentally important for social development. And that's something that since the discovery of early imitation, 1977, we've been trying to argue in the developmental literature. And thanks to Christian's work and others, there's now work in neurobiology that can help support that. So let me go a little bit to the brain basis of imitation. As I said, I'm going to get to studies um, further that have to do with empathy, development, touch, prejudice. I uh, have some time here, so I'm going to go through some studies on brain basis of imitation. We've done many studies. There's some three of them are listed in the bottom where we did EEG on the babies which is a way of measuring brain signals, and we could show the baby's actions or have them imitate the actions, and this is 14-month-old babies. In doing this study, we measure that's something called mu rhythm, a particular rhythm of the brain, and mu rhythm is by theory and by studies of adults thought to be measurable more in the central regions of the brain than the other regions of the brain when the babies execute or observe actions. So the central region of the brain is just as it sounds. It's just the central region that a strip of tissue that, let's say, goes uh, from ear to ear in the central part of your brain. And the prediction is that there's going to be a decrease in mu rhythm. In this case, the signal is a decrease. It's not an increase, it's a decrease. The theory based on adults is that there'll be a decrease in mu rhythm in the central area of the brain. And so we did a study with these 14-month-olds and that's exactly what we sat found in this paper. We used e EEG and we found a highly significant decrease in mu rhythm when they performed this action um, with, with a stick of watching somebody else push a button or they perform the action. When they executed the action, we found a decrease in mu rhythm. And then the important thing is when the babies just sat still and they saw somebody do this action, they just observed it, we found also a significant decrease in the central area where we would expect a mu rhythm. So this was our first clue with pre-verbal 14-month-olds on the type of studies that you heard about yesterday, connecting self and other, something about the neurobiology of imitation. Then we did a social interaction experiment. This is still a lab experiment. I know it's sort of dry science compared to you're out in the world saving children one child at a time, but let me get to that. I'm building up slowly in a scientific way way, we did a social interaction study when the child had EEG on in the same way, and here we had an object in front of the child, the child did an action, and we by experimental design 
either had the adult copy the baby, imitate what the baby was doing, or purposely mismatch what the baby was doing. So it was an experiment. And the really fascinating thing we found is more signal in the central area of the baby's brain when there was a match, when the adult interacting with the baby imitated what the baby did back rather than um, non-imitate. And this is important because imitating babies before they have language is a chief way of communicating with babies. You, you know, if you see a baby shake a rattle or bang a toy, they may bang and you'd lean forward and you'd say, hi honey, do you want to bang the rattle? You want to bang the rattle? And you quite naturally do the same thing back. Um, often th therapists tell you that if you want to make sure that your partner knows you're being heard, Imitating back what they say is a good thing. So in my case, my wife might come home from work and say, boy, it was a hard day. I know to say, honey, it was a hard day. And she thinks I'm being very sensitive what she's saying because I'm imitating back. So imitation tugs at your heart. It also tugs at your brain. Your brain recognizes when the social partner is imitating you rather than mismatching you, matching you, and that happens in the 14-month-old brain before you can say, honey, did you have a hard day? You can imitate the baby's actions. The baby's brain instantly recognizes the match as opposed to the mismatch. So when bodies are in synchrony, brain rhythms change, and this gave us an idea about how to use music and induce synchrony between children that I want to talk about as the last section of this talk, but hold this in mind. So now to things about the neural origins of empathy in young children, and here it follows uh, work of people in this audience who have talked about empathy, obviously, and so there's Mary's justly famous book, book about the roots of empathy and the idea that love grow, grows brains, the importance of social interaction, of emotions, of babies recognizing the pers or children recognizing that others are different from them and have perspectives that differ from them, but that empathy can unite us and that emotions are a universal language that can bring us together. So she has strongly argued this, develop programs that you're involved deeply in and that Nora in Seattle was involved in and so forth. Uh, Christian, who talked to you yesterday, wrote a great book about the empathetic brain and his other article, 2010 article in Nature Reviews Neuroscience, talked about somatosensory perception. Somatosensory is a big word that has to do with touch and its importance for empathy. So these three um, works influenced our own. I had done, since 1977, work on imitation and self-other connection and how babies learn from watching others. But I wanted to fold in touch and get to something like empathy. So there's a leap that I'm going to be make here that has been made by these others that I spoke about, about the neural representation of the body, perhaps, in the baby's brain is one mechanism for connecting self and other that's important and touch and recognizing touch of self and other might help uh, relate to and inform our theories of imitation, social learning, interpersonal connectivity, and even empathy. So I want to turn now to the importance of touch. Touch is enormously important to human beings. It's important to babies. There is a something like a touch hunger of us wanting to be touched as adults, and babies even have a touch hunger for skin-to-skin -skin contact. It's incredibly important for attachment relationships, and touch is a mode of communication to young kids. But what happens in the baby's brain when the baby is touched, something that Christian has studied in adults? But what happens in the baby's brain? Well, it turns out that historically there's been a lot of research on touch as a be taking behavioral measures, but very, very little until quite recently research on how touch affects the brain. So I'm showing you a picture of the brain out here, and this is uh, somatosensory cortex. This is sensory motor cortex that's in the central area that I talked about last time. And so 
this somatosensory cortex right over here is what you could think of as the touch center of the brain. And we are very interested in what happens in somatosensory cortex, the touch center of the brain, when the baby, uh, him or herself, is touched. And so somatosensory cortex is known to be laid out in a very, very interesting way. Some of you might have seen this picture, but I'm going to use this picture in our research, so I want to just uh, take a second to pause on it. Your body is laid out in the central area of your brain in a very systematic way from the bottom of your feet uh, over here to the top of your head over here. And this is the center part of your brain. This is down the middle part of your brain. Your foot is sort of um, in the inner hemisphere wall. And then as you go to the side, laterally, as you go to your side, you get to the hand region in adults. And so we had the idea that since the foot region and the hand region are some distance apart in the brain, that we might be able to use EEG and MEG to measure that in the baby's brain. And I want to talk about how we did that and then how that has to do with empathy because it's an interesting story. So we used a device that's called uh, magnetoencephalography, or MEG for short, and that's that little uh, movie that I had showed you before. MEG is much more powerful than EEG. EEG has those sensors on the baby's brain, which we used in the previous experiment. EEG is great for getting timing information. You can know when something happened in the brain, but it does not provide very precise spatial localization. MRI provides a very good spatial resolution, but very poor timing information, and besides, the babies have to be asleep, so it's not a good way of testing social interaction. So MEG is this wonderful tool, and we have an MEG device at the University of Washington. Here's a six-month-old in the MEG device, and you can see that this is six-month-old who's actually listening to sound uh, through earphones. The MEG is turned on, there's sound on this tape, there's nothing clunking in the baby's ears, and it's a silent device. It's a 100% safe device, and the baby can move in it. And so this baby can watch social interaction, uh, they can be touched by an adult, you can smile at the baby and see in at the millisecond level what happens at the baby's brain when the baby experiences different emotions. And so we're incredibly excited to have this new tool, an MEG device at the University of Washington. We used it in one of our first studies for touch because touch and somatosensory processing is such a basic part of the babies, skin to skin contact response to touch. And so I want to show you a baby's brain here. This is a 29-week-old baby, and the hand region, you remember from what I uh, had shown you in the other slide, is lateral on the brain around here. This is the whole brain of the baby taken from the side. The hand area is about here. And we had 29-week-old babies. We were shaking with excitement to do this study, first in the world who could have a baby in MEG and touch the baby's hand. What lights up in the brain? Is it just diffuse that everything lights up? Do you see activation in the hand area? So here's a, a film that we made of the activation from MEG in a 29-week-old baby. And I want to show you what lights up. The film's playing starting now. We touched the baby, and boom, we saw activity in the hand area where we'd expected. It wasn't in the frontal lobe, wasn't in the temporal, wasn't in the back of the brain, in the visual area, in the occipital lobe. We saw activity pretty well localized and within the hand area of the baby's brain. Then I want to turn around the baby's brain for you because the foot area is hanging down here in the inner hemisphere wall. Let me just show you what happens. We test the same 29-week-old baby boom, we see activity in the hand area. It's a beautiful, oh, in the foot area, beautiful activation in the foot area in a 29-week-old baby. That was experiment one in this paper that just got published uh, a couple months ago. Experiment two, of course, 
is we showed somebody else being touched. So here nothing was touching the baby's body. The baby watched somebody else's body being touched and we discovered that when they watched somebody's hand being touched, the same hand area in the baby's brain lit up. When they watched somebody's foot being touched, a differential area of their brain lit up, their foot area lit up, when they watch somebody else's brain being touched. Now, Christian had discovered that he and his colleagues had discovered this in adults, but we were the first to see it in babies. And again, it is a very, very powerful thing to see that another baby is connected to our body. Their processing of how uh, our body is being touched is processed through neural systems in their brain that is processing their own touch. Nothing could be a closer self-other connection than that. And I think it has to do with imitation and the beginnings of looking at the neurobiology of imitation. Because in order to imitate, when that baby sees a head touch, you notice the child doesn't use her foot to bang it, doesn't use her hand to bang it, which is the common body part. The baby sees a head touch, and the baby knows to lean forward and touch with her head. So the baby maps that body out there to my body, your hand to my hand. I, the baby sees another body move and maps that body onto their own. So in order to imitate, the baby needs to know two things, what body part to move and then what action to do with it. And this research is looking at how they identify what body part to move. But it's a very, very early development, and it's exciting to do it. We believe it has to do with the roots of empathy because we're able to see that the baby can, we haven't done the study of whether they can feel your pain, but they can feel your touch. When they visually see you being touched, it's the touch centers in the baby's brain, somatosensory cortex, and the foot area that's being activated. So Peter Marshall and I, Peter Marshall's at Temple University. Peter Marshall was the collaborator on those touch studies and was now is a collaborator with the MEG work. We wrote a paper in Trends in Cognitive Science that's a pretty accessible paper, actually. It talks about wide-ranging things, especially how touch uh, relates to empathy and emotional development, and we called it body maps in the infant brain. There are, of course, body maps in adult brains that have been well studied. We're trying to map out the baby's brain. And the new paper that just came out is here. If you're, quite, if you're interested in this MEG study, it's in a paper called Developmental Science and uh, just came out. And it is study two that's about the baby observing touch. So we call it infant brain responses to felt and observed touch, okay? And then the discussion section sort of amplifies the meaning of all that. So we're very excited about this new touch study. I want to um, go forward to another aspect of child development and learning that has to do with gaze filing because Mary talks a lot about perspective taking and the fact that in order to cut across cultural differences, we need to be able to take other people's perspective and then empathy is in some sense emotional perspective taking. There isn't just a confusion between self and other, but one can recognize the other is different, might have other perspectives than us, but feel the sameness with the other person as well. So we're looking at those kinds of ideas with gaze filing, we and many people in the world, but I wanna show you our study. This is a 12-month-old baby sitting eye to eye with Rochelle Brooks in our lab, and in our lab we have two inanimate objects equidistant from the baby. Rochelle looks at the baby and they make eye contact and then because we're experimentalists, Rochelle talk, lo looks randomly to one side or another and here she turns to this object and the little baby turns and looks just where the adult is. So in this experiment, the adult looks randomly from one side to the other in other studies we have them look up and the baby as if connected with a bungee cord follows the adult point of view. Now this is the roots of perspective taking, quite literally. The social brain, the social baby, wants to share attention with an adult, wants to follow where the adult is looking. And we've done many, many studies on the mechanisms of, of uh, joint attention in young babies. Uh, and this paper and others talk about gaze following as the roots of 
uh, perspective taking. So um, I hope that you would be interested in that. Uh, now I want to go to uh, some studies that we've done with emotions that combine gaze following, imitation, and emotions in the following way. Children don't only have emotions directed at them, they do have that, but they don't only have that, they also do what we call emotional eavesdropping, which is they watch interactions between other people, between mother and father, teacher and sib, two sibs fighting. They watch social interaction out in the world and they can learn from that. Going back to the first part of my talk, they can learn to, from that. It doesn't have to always be directed at them. And so we did a study, or many studies, on this series of papers, a big, long research program about emotional eavesdropping called when a child eavesdrop on somebody else's social interaction, what do they learn from that? So here's the study that we did. I'm going to show you a little film of it. We had an adult use a stick and press a button. It went buzz, buzz, buzz. It buzzed. The child was across the table and watching that, and we knew from control experiments the baby wanted to grab the stick and imitate. But we had a new person, a third party, walk in the room. Her name was Nina, as it turns out. She walked in the room. She looked like a perfectly nice person. She sat down next to the adult who was buzzing, and when the next person buzzed, she turned angrily to the adult and said, that's annoying. And the baby watched wide-eyed during this social interaction. So let me just show you. We did this with 15 and 18-month-olds. Here's the little baby. See? That was me making sound there. Look at this. There. Now, the baby wants to take that stick and buzz, but Nina's going to come in. Baby doesn't know what's going to happen. Hi, Barrett. I'm going to sit here and read a magazine. OK. That's Nina. Nina's going to sit and read a magazine. Nina, look at this. That's aggravating. That's so annoying. Oh, I thought it was really interesting. Well, that's just your opinion. It's aggravating. So I know that doesn't happen in Toronto, but it happens in Seattle. Babies can watch negative interactions. How does that affect their learning? How does it affect their imitation? Let me show you this baby when given the stick. After watching the adult get angry, the adult now has a neutral face, but she's watching the baby. Here. Oops. So baby shuts down. Wouldn't you like to know what's going on inside the baby's brain? We want to do this when the baby's in MEG. Going to be a fabulous, fabulous study. But let me tell you some of the research behavior that we, we have done now. There's several hypotheses about what's going on, but the one thing you can see is that the baby is looking at the adult who is not showing the negative emotion now. The baby has in memory that that adult had gotten angry when this person pressed this button with the stick, she's not going to do it. But what's the mechanism mediating that? There's several of them. One of it could be that the baby saw the negative emotion and just got frightened or upset because there was negativity in the room. We think babies are doing something more sophisticated than that, but we're scientists, so we wanted to test it. And the way we tested that is we had Nina come in the room, watch and get just as angry, did exactly the same thing when the button was pushed, and then Nita got up from the table and walked away and left the room. And the baby looked at the room to see Nina was gone, grabbed the stick, and did buzzing. <laughs> so it isn't, <laughs> it isn't just contagion that the baby saw negativity and the baby's entire system shut down. That was possible, but that's not it because there was just as much anger in the room. Then there's Descartes' famous mind-body problem. Instead of having Nina's body gone, we left Nina in the room. She got just as angry. And then before the baby was given the stick, Nina turned around so she couldn't watch the baby. The baby looked at Nina, turned around, and did the action. Then we had Nina face the adult, uh, face the child. Nina got as angry was angry, and then Nina picked up a book and started reading the book. The baby picked up the stick, bent down to see that Nina was looking at the book, and then pressed the button. 
So it turns out it's not just anger in the room. It's not just that the angry person is present. It's that the previously angry person who didn't, who got angry at somebody doing this action is now watching me. That angry person is watching me. I have the stick. I better not do that action. She got angry at that person. She's probably going to get angry at me. I am like that person, this is the like me idea. She got angry at her, she's going to get angry at me. So this is an amazing social calculation that the child's doing, but notice that it's social learning. Notice that the baby is learning as a third party observer to other people's social interactions. So this multiplies the baby's social and emotional world. Yes, they have a rich internal social world. Yes, when you're in dyadic interaction with them, they can recognize your emotions, they can process the emotions directed to them, but you know what? Because babies have this like me theory, they are watching other social interactions and how you or somebody interacts with somebody else. The baby puts themselves in that adult's shoes and is learning about emotions and is learning about emotional interactions just by what they observe. Now that's a powerful case of role modeling and the power of social learning. And it means that people want to be quite aware of the interactions that they're having in front of babies, not just two babies. So here are three important points, and then I want to uh, move on. Three important points for this is, first, I think the study on emotional eavesdropping has to do with the first kind of instances of self-regulation in babies. Babies are able to regulate their own activity. We often think of babies as being impulsive. It's said that babies have no executive control. It's say that said that they can't regulate their activities. But the 15-month-old baby that you could observe in this experiment picks up this stick regulates her activity very, very well. And I prove to you it wasn't just that she was frightened. It wasn't just that the system shut down. She would do the action under some conditions, but not in others, not in the condition that she knew she, you were the center of her attention. So babies, even as young as 15-month-olds, do, so do show self-regulation in the presence of emotional signals. So this emotional self-regulation this uh, regulation of your actions based on emotions we think is very important. And one of the reasons people had argued we think that babies don't have much self-regulation is that they were doing purely cognitive tasks or things about could they inhibit grabbing food, which has survival value for them to get those calories in. You never know when the calories will disappear. So whether babies can regulate self-regulate, have executive function in those situations is different than arguing, different than arguing that the baby brain has no capacity for regulating things based on social signals in the world. They can regulate their activity, their own actions, based on emotions that they see even when those emotions aren't directed at them. That's pretty sophisticated self-regulation. Of course, babies have a lot of development in executive function to go, not arguing otherwise. I'm just putting in a good word for the babies that there is some capacity to regulate their behavior based on emotions they see. Secondly, we've recently done some studies about whether babies make attributions to the person based on the emotions that that person commonly shows. So we as adults um, uh, typecast people, we pigeonhole people, we know, we know that when we see Mary, she's going to bring a smile to our face. She always brings a smile to my face. I was kind of tense when I walked in here this morning. She said, oh, Andy, good to see you. So my version of Mary, I have a personality of her as a comforting, communicative, um, compassionate human being. There are other people that when I approach, I think, oh boy, this is going to be a bad day when they walk down the hall. So it is important that we as adults actually keep track of the emotional history that we've had in interacting with one person or another person. Do babies? That's my question. It has never been thought that babies have these emotional files where they're keeping track of what one person's personality is like or how they interact. To make a long story short, 
We did this study about, um, which is this 2016 paper in developmental psychology, about babies keeping track of people's emotional histories. And basically, a per if a person, Nina, had gotten angry at an adult for doing an action, even if you give the baby a new toy, if Nina comes in the room, <laughs> Babies will not do the new action with the new toy if this previously angry person who has never been angry at that toy is in front of the baby and watching them. The baby thinks that's a negative person, that's an anger prone person and it's not just because they shut down and are scared because of these elaborate experiments we do of the angry person could be in the room and leave. They keep track of the emotional history of the person then they register that person is watching me, so I better not do this novel action with a toy because this angry prone person may get angry at me. And the last point I want to make is called hostile attribution uh, bias. There are clinical psychologists who have come up with a very interesting notion that there are some four, five, and six-year-olds who have hostile attribution bias. When they meet a new person, they, alas, might think that that person is about ready to do them harm, about ready to interact in a negative way with them, so they have a bias of attributing hostility to people they've not met. The clinical origins of that are not so well known, but it's a syndrome that can be established, and we're now thinking that it comes in part from the observations that these children may have made. It could be that they've had people bully them, act angry at them, that's possible. But even if there hasn't been emotional abuse directed at them, we now think that their third party interactions, observing somebody else being abusive or negatively interacting with another person out there, when they see it, children may develop a hostile attribution environment. That person, the world is a negative place. So we think it's quite important. Um, I'm going to um, move on quickly here to the roots of prejudice. Um, and I think I'm going to just need to move a little more quickly here. So we've done with four and five-year-olds this idea of where do they get bi social bias from. This is an extrapolation from social learning that I've been fascinating with, with. This is sort of the dark side of that. Can they catch prejudice from watching others? So we had a four, four and five-year-old sit in front of a screen. They had a little movie in front of them that we made. And we had an adult in the middle of the movie, uh, in the middle picture here. And she turned to one of the adults and acted very positively and said, oh, hi, how are you? And this is for you and gave that person a toy. And then she turned around and turned to this person and she acted in a bias way. She did this, she gave him a toy, but she said, ugh. Here, this is for you. So the little child watched, and uh, let me just show you the film, it's the easiest thing. She's watching the film. Um, here we go. Hi. Hi. That was the positive interaction. Then she turns to the negative person. Hi. Ooh. And then we ask her, who do you want to interact with? and she points to the positive person. We say, who do you want to share your toy with? She shuns the person who the adult had acted negatively to and will only share her toy with the person who had been interacted with positively. There are many measures we used, including imitation, including learning from the other peer. And basically, they shun the person who they had seen the adult act negatively or in a biased way to. So we've then done experiments with groups where the person that you're acting negatively to wears a certain t-shirt, like a red t-shirt. And the person you interact positively to wears a different color t-shirt. And then we have new people come in the room that you don't act positive and negatively to, but they just wear the same t-shirt as the person you had shunned, that the adult had shunned before. And we get the same results. The children shun, do not want to share with, do not want to interact with and learn from the, per the person that the adult, the type of person, the person dressed the same as, the person that you interacted negatively with. So we are role models from our children. They are watching our nonverbal signals, no surprise to you in this room. They watch the positive signals, they watch the negative signals, 
and they group people, people who look like that, in this case, people who dress like that, they perhaps are a group of people that are shunned by the adults. So learning bias is something that's very powerful and caught by watching the role models in your society. I live in the United States of America now. This is an important study to be doing. Um, and we're happy to be doing this study showing that your role models, it matters what your children see. Very, very quickly, because I'm running out of time, this was a new study that we just finished 2000, well, 2017, and it has to do with music and synchrony, and music is part of the Roots of Empathy, Seeds of Empathy program. Mary has always been fascinated by m music, and I think correctly saw that music is a way that connects self and other, deeply connected to emotion. We're scientists that are interested in that. Here's a famous picture of kids listening to music, marching in synchrony with another. Synchrony is important. I'm a scientist, so my first impulse is to go into the lab. So we did a lab study on synchrony. We built a swing set with the timing of which could be precisely controlled and monitored. And we, either, we took four and a half year old children, same sex dyads. We tested 162 kids. A lot of kids randomly assigned to three groups. One group would be, we, we um, assigned them to the synchrony group, and we had people swing them so the kids moved in perfect synchrony with another. A second independent group of, of same-sex dyads, boys and girls were counterbalanced, but what we had is the swings would be out of synchrony with one another. And then we had a baseline group where they didn't have any synchrony experience at all. And we want to know is, as Mary has been interested in, could you increase empathy and cooperation through experience with synchrony, which music provides, but we wanted to just isolate synchrony. So we did a measure of cooperation, that's a lab measure of cooperation, not of empathy, but of cooperative behavior. And one cooperative behavior is after you moved in synchrony, the kids, or a synchrony or baseline, the kids got off the swing. We said, oh, here we have a game to play. And the game was that if you push these buttons, only if you push the buttons at the same time of one another, you had to cooperate. Then on the screen, this is a little insert of on the screen, an animal pops out of the box. And then if you hit this again, another animal pops out of the box. The kids love to do it with this, uh, graph shows is that kids who had been swung, the peers that had been swung, were able to push these th buttons together in a shorter time. They did so much more quickly uh, than the kids who were in asynchrony baseline. So they got better at cooperating. Lower means faster time. Let me show you this, the boys, that's going to happen quickly, where they're in front of the button. They had been swinging synchrony together. Here are the boys. And then it pops up. <laughs> And they laugh. Let me show you again. I see it plays. And it pops up. So that's the game. And there's these series of boxes. And it's very hard for four and a half year olds. They, if they've been out of synchrony, you tell them to press together. They don't know how to do that. And they go. And they're all out of sync. Amazingly, the kids who had an experimental intervention of moving together, their bodies had moved together in space, now can act synchronously together. We did another task, which was handing something back and forth. This is a really cool task. Here the child, they would swing together or not, and here the child, uh, there's a plexiglass um, a bar here, here blocking uh, this child from handing the toy directly to this child, so this child has to put this toy underneath and through this hole, and we say your, your job is to share this toy with this person. Let me just show you what they do. Here's the kids after synchrony. Beautiful sharing. And there's a kind of musical aspect to the sharing. I mean, a rhythm, watch, she's... She's kind of going underneath and, and sharing it in rhythm to the, to the child. So the basic bottom line here is 
they're faster again than the kids who had been in asynchrony or baseline in sharing the toys with another. So we have, because we're scientists, we have this objective measure of cooperation, banging together, or speed to share. We love these objective measures. But we can do an experiment where we assign them randomly to synchrony. If you have the kids in bodily synchrony, they're going to share more than one another. And so our questions, we just published this. It's in this journal, 2017. How long lasting is this experience? Uh, what if you had real musical experience, not just our swinging together, but like Mary does as parts of the program, playing music together. That makes your body move in synchrony, but it also has other melodies and other things that come through music and emotions of a music, not just swinging together. How long lasting? What happens if we make it musical experience? Um, is it stronger if it's with other things like you have in Roots of Empathy? Not, not only music, but other things like learning from babies and uh, maybe part of the power of the program that's been developed is that music and synchrony and attention to bodily synchrony between people is part of the program. So I am out of time and I'm gonna take uh, two minutes or one minute doing these slides about dissemination. We run an institute called Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, and we're trying to get the word out about what I talked about today. And this is getting the science out and showing the practical application of science. I know the Roots of Empathy program, Seeds of Empathy, is actually out there doing good in the real world. We don't do good in the real world. We do research about doing good. But we do think it's important to get that research out. Mary is one of the people who are running practical programs that affect children who are so good at respecting and paying attention to the scientists, having research symposium, valuing the scientists, and that's why she came to the University of Washington. We had a great conversation, and her uh, interest in helping kids is what's leading us to do this synchrony program. But we're interested in dissemination, and one dissemination is to about brain development to our fellow scientists, and that was published here, and this article is about the social uh, getting social into a science of learning. So it was an argument about why social has to be part of the science of learning. We're interested in getting uh, information about behavior out to the public, and this is our book called The Scientist in the Crib, and it's the idea that babies are like little scientists exploring the world. I know you're interested in emotions. Scientists are not emotionless. We're driven by curiosity, by the pleasure of discovery. When we say the scientist, in the crib, we're saying the baby is a scientist who's just as curious, just as passionate about learning about others as adult psychologists are. There are little psychologists or sociologists in the crib. But we also are doing this, which is we have free training modules online that we're very proud of that is for mothers, parents, government officials, and uh, people running programs that are available in various languages thanks to funders of our institute, and these are free to parents and program directors. And what the modules are, we have about 20 of them now. There's modules about brain development that talk about the importance of brain development first five years of life. There's modules about emotions and self-regulation, about race, about causality, STEM, thing attachment, things that parents and, pro and government officials ask about. And so we wanted to embed our films, like I showed you the film of imitation or gaze following or brain reactions to touch. As scientists, we thought, you know, we kind of like our science. We want other people to know about our science, but we recognize that it can't only be asleep in the scientific articles, has to come alive, and we've made 10 and 15 minute videos that has authentic scientific films from the lab with a narrator who is speaking uh, in a way that is very, very, very accessible. And so we're kind of proud of this library of modules and we're very happy that it can be for free. Um, and so this isn't advertisement that's anything else but trying to emulate Mary and do just a little bit of good. So thank you very much. Thanks.